ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, lend me your ear. Hello, hello people, how are we doing today? It's your host Q live and direct from the Psyche Lab Studio in New Delhi. I hope you all are having a good time. Welcome to the Realm Breaking where we sit down with creatives, design and business pioneers, discuss their journey, process and approach. If you're listening to this podcast for the first time, consider subscribing because we put new episodes every Thursday. Also check out our website and YouTube. We have a slowly growing Discord community where we have weekly design sessions where we learn something new. This podcast is supported by Psyche Lab, a creative company that works around UX and CGI driven design. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, give us ratings. It helps us to reach to bigger audience. If you have any inputs, suggestions for our podcast, you can DM us on Instagram or shoot me a mail mentioned in the podcast description. For this episode, we have Akanksha Mirdha who, who takes care of the design at Playground AI, a free-to-use online AI image creator based in the Bay Area. Akanksha has extensive experience in using AI effectively and has worked with some of the most innovative teams at brands like Uber. During our conversation, we discussed the future of AI, her experiences working as the only designer in the team at Playground, her approach to building effective design teams. She also shared insights into her collaboration with design teams at Midjourney and how they successfully integrated AI into their design process. So without further ado, let's dive into this exciting conversation. Hello Akanksha, how are you doing today? Thank God. How are you? Doing fine. I had a long day. I'm assuming it's a, it's a, a early in the day to where you are. Yeah, I'm I'm located in San Francisco, so it's uh, five six minutes to six a.m. in the morning. But I'm but I'm very really excited for this. Yeah, cheers! Uh, thanks for uh, getting on the podcast. Uh, so, are you like a uh, belong to do you like belong to a five a.m. club? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can probably tell looking at my face. Like this is probably like my peak energy. Like I, I start super early in the morning. I think it's like around. No one would I start to like taper off, but like morning 6 a.m. to like noon are just definitely like my most productive hours. Yeah, yeah, till noon it's like six hours. I mean, that's like a big chunk of the day. What time is it? How, how's it going with you? What's happening, uh, you know, at the Bay Area? Uh, what's happening? Tell us something about yourself. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh... I'm, at, like I mentioned already, I'm based out of San Francisco. And um, the recent thing is the storm that hit the city. So it's, San Francisco is very much like Bangalore. And, um, you know, Bangalore just has such a moderate, nice climate all throughout the year. And San Francisco is very similar in that sense. The temperature range is like slightly lower, like it's a little colder here. Uh, but we had like a snowstorm hit the city. So there's a, there's a chance of there being a snowfall, which is what's top of my mind right now because I can like hear the rain pouring outside I'm like okay at some point it's gonna turn into flurries yeah I mean I just co- coincidentally checked the weather as well and I got like a you know all these news bulletin talking about these hazard you're mentioning yeah. so I hope you're keeping yourself safe and indoors yeah yeah definitely gonna gonna be spending time indoors let's take a deep dive in your career uh, I mean you you was you started in India uh, and uh, you start with engineering. Is this what yeah. you wanted to do, or, or just yeah. like most, <laughs> you wanted to be a part of the a part of the crew? Yeah, I would say I wouldn't say like I disliked engineering. I I was okay with like science and math, and pretty much everyone was doing that around me. And there was, like you said, there was this expectation from like everyone around me that I, if I am good at it, I should just like do science and math and. The other options, obviously, bio. Um, so I'd say I was okay with it. I know it was like it was making me sad, uh, but it also didn't make me really happy. Uh, and it was always like design. I wouldn't really say design. I actually didn't realize what it was that I enjoyed the most. Um, for most part, growing up, I would just enjoy drawing um, and like the arts and crafts class. Um, and I remember at some point, like when we're in school, we used to have like this drawing class and 
in like at a certain class, they stop the drawing class because they're like, okay, this is not needed anymore. I think it's usually on like fourth grade or fifth grade. And I remember being yeah. very sad when that happened. I was like, okay, the grade now used to count. So anyway, they were like not valuing it as much as science or math. And now they're just getting rid of it altogether. So I remember that being like one moment where I felt I liked or enjoyed that thing. Um, but then it didn't kick in until like later on uh, when I joined undergrad. So when I joined undergrad, I got to do this like summer internship program at CMU, which is when I actually interacted with a lot of like quote unquote designers, people who were professionally doing design either for games or products or like digital um, apps. So that's when I interacted with them and that's when I felt like, okay, that's the job that seems a lot more fun and I think it will make me really happy if I do that. So I started doing it on the side and that's how I kind of got into design. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, I mean, this is this is the that curiosity part which you know which uh, uh, drags you towards design. Even for me, you know, I mean, I used to look forward to all these you know uh, creative things. That I was, uh, I think, I was I was fortunate enough to you know uh, 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 realize that there's something uh, something called Photoshop out there. Tell me, okay, something about design. So yeah, it, it was definitely a, a great shift. So I mean, is this was the uh, was the time where you were learning about design at the same time? Or you were just curious, okay, okay, this is what design is all about and I, I might uh, hop onto it. I was learning it on the side. And you know how like colleges have these like events that you create posters for or there's always like a little bit of need for like some creative work, like there's your creative work. And that's kind of when I picked up Photoshop. There was nothing to learn on the side, but it, it wasn't like the dots had not been connected. Like I didn't know where I would use that skill set. So for the longest time, it was still like, okay, once I graduate, I'll get a job as a software engineer at a tech company in India. Um, it was only when I like got to know of Silicon Valley and that designers actually play such a significant role in creating the products. That's when I was like, okay, you know, like this skill actually just fits very perfectly with that kind of a role. And I should have made say how to get in those kind of roles. Yeah, uh, and uh, this, this, uh, this whole uh, uh, space got you a place in Uber. I guess. Was it your job? Yeah, I was. Yeah, that was my first design job. I was very fortunate. Um, so I did my master's right after my undergrad. Um, so I told you that I did this like summer internship when I was an undergrad, which really influenced me. And I, that I think was the pivotal moment for me when I decided that, okay, I want to be a designer. I don't think I want to like go to a software engineering job. So I pursued a master's uh, here um, in the US um, at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And right after that, I got a job at Uber. Right, all right. So how was that transition, you know, when you when you were actually working on, you know, something which is which was out there? Uh, so how was the transition for you? I mean, you had an idea what you wanna what you were about to do, or it was like on every step you were, you know, questioning yourself. Yeah, it's definitely hard, uh, because there are certain like when you go to when you start applying for like these design roles, you realize that there's like two personas. There's the there's the candidate who's done engineering and now wants to become a designer, which was basically me. Um, and then there's the candidate who's always had a very traditional design background. And um, you're kind of like, when the interviewer sees interviews for the position, they're interviewing both of these profiles and they both have different strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, like very early on, I remember at science, like, my visual design skills weren't as good as some of the other candidates who had a more traditional art school background. Like I would look at their designs and it'd be like, wow, that looks amazing. Like I'm like only 50% there. Um, so there's initially there was definitely a lot of insecurity because I was like, okay, there is this like very clear um, component of this job that I'm not the strongest at. Uh, but then I realized that the role is like very wide and there's different areas that you can master, right? Like broad design is so broad. It's, that's the reason it's different from graphic design, right? Like if I'd been going for a graphic designer role right out of school, I don't think I would have been successful. But broad design was so broad. I had a lot of interest in just driving and talking to users. So I remember when, um, I presented like a, a grad school project for my Uber interview. Uh, I just done so much user research um, that the, when the user when the when the interviewers were talking to me, they were 
asking me questions about why did you do things a certain way. I just like had so many user quotes. And I remember when they did a debrief, like when they give you the offer, they kind of tell you that, okay, this is what we liked about you. And that was one of the bigger things that they liked. They were like, okay, you actually went really deep in terms of understanding what you're des- who you're designing for. So you've done a lot of user interviews. You had a very good understanding of what the user was want. Uh, and that's the reason we want you on the team. So I'd say, I tried to like figure out my strengths, but there was certainly like when you're making the transition, there's always certain areas where you know you're not as strong as other candidates and those make you hesitant. Um, and then of course, there are people who'd been de- doing design for like six years, seven years, and I had just started doing design because I'd spent four years doing engineering and studying subjects, which weren't really helpful in design. So it's definitely a little hard in the beginning, but then my approach was to really just double down on areas where I thought um, I had a bit of an advantage. So yeah, by, while moving on into that, uh, uh, you know, into that space, uh, you also found your interest. Okay, so this is something I, you know, I'd specifically like to do or, uh, or, or, or you maybe decide to, you know, reach out to other brands to work. Oh, when I was graduating? Uh, no, it's the it's when you were at Uber, where you also like uh, specified yourself. Okay, this is something where I'd like to work on, or or you were you know open to explore more and uh, uh, you know and maybe expand your skill set. So I very specifically interviewed for the product designer role, and that was mostly what I was doing. Um, but yeah, like for a new grad, they're like big tech companies are like fairly flexible, so they let you explore options. Like they know you're just like fresh out of school there's a lot of people who like within their first year either from like design become a pm or from like engineering go become a pm uh so they're like fairly open in terms of what people get to do in their like first one one and a half year but i had interviewed very specifically for design i knew that was what i wanted to do um but yeah there's definitely opportunities (laughs) Yeah, so you later hopped on to a more startup oriented space because, you know, right now, I mean, at Uber, you it was more, you you had assigned tasks, okay, this is something that you have to do. Now you are at a totally, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, a startup space. How was that transition? Yeah, uh, I, I, overall, I'd say it was challenging, but also fun. Like this is the period where I grew the most as a designer. Um, Uber's really good. Uh, as a big tech company, like the experience you have at these big tech companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, it's very different from the startup experience. So I usually like if people ask me like, okay, where should I start? Like as a new grad, should I join a big tech company or a startup? I would say like, just look very deeply um, into what these experiences entail, right? Like at a big company, you get a lot of mentorship um, and you get to see what, top tier work looks like and you set a really high bar for yourself because you see what the best designers in the industry are creating right there's a lot of mentorship there's a lot of guidance if you do certain mistakes um there's room for them to be corrected because you have this massive design team um there's a lot of um hand holding with design systems being so elaborate nowadays um, and if you go to companies like Uber, they have one of the biggest design systems I've ever seen. And I remember like design systems were becoming a thing when I was at the company and the company just, the design team invested so heavily in the design system. And I remember design interns having such an easy time making designs because there was such a good system in place. So I would say that's one of the bigger advantages of going to a big tech company. There's a lot of hand holding. Um, and overall, it's just a very, uh, you, you get to see how like a big company works, like how a well-oiled machine works. You see what people in different roles do. You see what sales does. You see what customer ops do. You see what PMs do. You also see a wide variety of like people being good and bad at the jobs. You like interact with so many PMs, you know that, okay, this is a good PM versus this is probably not such a good PM. So that's the good thing about big tech. Um, at a startup, you... A lot of these constraints are gone. So there's no hand holding. You're mostly by yourself. Um, and you have to know very clearly 
firstly your strengths because at times you can be insecure you can be like oh i don't know like i'm doing this exploration but we didn't use it in the product or um i, I don't know what the founder wants i don't know where the team is going i don't know where the company is going so firstly you need to be like very self assured you need to know what your strengths are you need to know what you're supposed to bring to the table and from there i'd say the good part the best part is you actually get to define a lot of these systems that i mentioned right like i said uber had an amazing design system but when you're at a startup you're actually setting that foundation so startup people would find that fun but it's also extremely challenging it's not for everyone um so i recommend people like just you know gauge where your skill set is gauge where your interest is and see what are the areas where you want to know and um the last other thing that's really nice about startups is um just the the proximity to the users and how involved you are in defining what the product is so you know if if you're someone who sees themselves as uh, being a founder themselves someday at in like 2 years 3 years 10 years being working at a startup really gives you a very like close look at what exactly makes a good startups work and bad ones doesn't work like you very closely see okay how is the founder approaching things and you're constantly asking yourself okay how would i do things differently like if this was my company what would i do differently um so it's basically a really good training if you want to do a startup yourself at some point in in your career yeah so i mean uh, at uber were you like a kind of a specialist and now you were you know playing a role of a generalist so i mean this is this is this is i mean also i i think when you're working at a brand like uber you can you you also open a lot of doors for yourself so you could have gone to any other brand and you still choose to you know going into that startup space so was it your curiosity and you know uh, uh, or 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 maybe this is what you wanted you are more like a generalist Yeah yeah I think that's a great point like when you work for these kind of brands you actually like opportunities do line up for you like you have a very easy time getting your next role um so you can be very selective if you have a brand like Uber um for me it was really just uh, working in a smaller team uh I'd spent about like two and a half years at Uber and at some point I realized that um a lot of my focus and my energy was Uh, being spent on how to get a promotion instead of uh, being spent on how to make the best design or best product possible and i just felt like that wasn't the right mindset and at a big company this tends to happen right like when you have so many employees and you have so many layers of management uh the direct incentives don't necessarily align in a way that, that they result in the best product like people are mostly trying to like, move forward in their careers and the incentives are set such that um you try to like get a promotion or like level up there's always this goal of leveling up so for me it was like okay i think what really gives me happiness is just doing good design work i should try to find a place where there's a need for good design work and i'm not so obsessed with this like whole climbing the ladder thing like i remember at some point at uber i was just like very focused on just getting my next promotion which i don't think is the right mindset um and not was not something that I respected um so I think when I looked at okay what options do I have at this point it was very much that a smaller company a smaller company that doesn't really care about promotions because you're so small the teams are so small promotions aren't even a thing uh but the need is very clear and just good product design and everyone on the team just is aligned on that goal yeah so that was uh I'd say the reason I sort of like eventually ended up at a very small startup yeah i mean uh, you are pretty clear about what you uh, you know uh, wanted to choose uh, one more thing i i think i've i've felt in these startups that they you don't have like a lot of designers so that you know as as you said that there's a lot of hand uh, hand holding in, in like big brands so i mean were you the only designer when you moved to a startup or you had already had like a setup team out there Yeah, so I'd say I, I did like different steps. So after Uber, I joined Cruise, which was a mid-sized startup. It wasn't as small as my current startup. So Cruise was, I think, about a thousand people, and there were five or six designers on the team already. So they had started doing a lot of this like systems work, 
Um, so there was a basic design system in place, but it wasn't as advanced as Uber's, right? So um, there was a lot of work that still needed to be done. And that to me felt appropriate at that moment because I felt like, okay, this is a challenge I can handle. Like I'm not biting more than I can chew. And at Uber, I'd seen what an amazing design system looks like or what the world-class like mobile app design looks like. So I was able to bring a lot of that skill set into the cruise role and it just didn't feel like, okay, I was totally by myself. And then after cruise, after spending two years at cruise, I joined an even more small startup, which is where I am currently, where I'm the only designer. So I'd say I took like small steps. I didn't directly go from Uber with like a 300 person design team to being the only designer. I did like 300 person design team, 10 person design team, one person design team. Let, let's talk about what you what you're building at playground i mean you know we uh in india i mean we, we 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 are also every day we are seeing a lot of people getting into you know ai and you know learning more about it and it's, a, it's such a such a hot topic out there how is it in the bay area i mean that's where the real revolution is happening isn't it yeah i mean i feel like there's there's so much in this space that needs to be done so i feel like there's equally exciting stuff happening in india is here but i'd say there's definitely a lot of interest and it's such you know like it just unlocks so many possibilities like even when you start brainstorming your the the things that you used to think that okay will happen 10 years or 20 years from now are happening today right um and i don't know if you saw like spotify's that feature the the dj feature right and to me that felt like you know this is something when i was at uber we used to like make these futuristic decks where we'd be like, okay, what would transportation look like in 20 years from now? And we'd be like, oh, you just have like a mind control thing and like a chopper would show up. And Uber Air was actually a thing. Uh, but those were never feasible. Like they, they were always far-fetched. And I was thinking like a designer at Spotify maybe two years ago made a similar pitch and they thought, oh, what would like an amazing music experience look like? You, everyone has their own personal DJ. Uh, and two years ago, it probably felt far-fetched, but right now it's there, right? So that part, I think, is very exciting. The the speed at which things are moving, it's incredible, but it's also very overwhelming. Like at times, you're like, wow, there's so much to try, so much to learn. And then it's obviously a very competitive space because everyone, there's like, everyone knows that some new products or like some really big things are going to come out of this technology, but that hasn't been decided yet. So everyone wants a share of that pie. So it's very, I would say, competitive, but also pretty exciting. Um, and at Playground, we're specifically focused on, um, I'd say, our, our broad mission is to just let people create really good images and images such that they can actually use uh, that to work in their professional life. So um, when we started off, we noticed that a lot of people were using the tool, but they were creating a lot of fantasy art. And then I spoke to a bunch of these users and I asked them, what are you using this art for? They're like, no, I'm just using this for recreation. And uh, I asked them like, okay, why are you using this for just recreation? Like, what is your full-time job? Is this not helpful in your full-time job at all? And a lot of these users were marketers or people in creative jobs. And they were like, I'd want to use this in my full-time job, but it's not quite there, right? Like if you look at uh, some of the images that are generated by these tools, like the eyes are a little off or the hands are a little off. And they were like, it's not there yet. Like I, it's not good enough for my full-time job. So it's just a recreation for me. Um, and I think that helped us get some clarity in terms of what we wanted to deliver. So our mission at this point is to really make something that helps people do their creative jobs better. Um, and it shouldn't feel like, oh, it's like 80% there. It's not like 100% there. Like I wouldn't use this photo in my portfolio because it's not good enough for my portfolio. It's like good for just like side project stuff or something. So we're trying to like narrow that gap. So we're trying to launch very like um, specific masking tools and editing tools. Uh, and the goal is to make just like that whole image creation experience end to end very simple, very easy. Um, and you know how like Photoshop, you mentioned Photoshop at some point, but Photoshop has a bit of a learning curve to it. It takes a while to get really good at Photoshop and only a few in the world can use Photoshop very proficiently. 
Um, so the, there's also this goal around usability that playgrounds should be usable for everyone. It shouldn't be um, requiring such a uh, such a specialized skill that only a few people can use it. Like everyone should be able to create good images. Um, yeah, so that's what we're trying to do at Playground. Yeah, d- does this uh, make uh, you know platform like Mid Journey and Dali the direct competitors? Yeah, so Dali and Mid Journey, you can say they are in the same space, but they're very much, I'd say, focused on um, that like initial brainstorming phase, right? Like how to create a big variety of images, how to create um, just images that are not possible. I'd say with like one step, like like right right after that, there's the next step, right, where you're like fine tuning the images which is where like Photoshop comes in. So I'd say I'd compare ourselves more to Photoshop where it's like photo refinement and post-processing. Um, and Dali and Midjourney are like one step before us. They're a little more foundational. They, that's where the image generation is happening. And we, we use Stable Diffusion. So I'd say like that's another like platform that's like right before us in the pipeline. Um, so I'd say if, I'm, if I had to be very specific... I would say we're very much in the Photoshop realm and not necessarily the Dali mid-journey stable diffusion realm. Yeah, I mean, working uh, again, or, uh, as we've discussed about AI, I mean, it's it's the, it's that hot topic. And I'm sure there are a lot of similar uh, projects like Playground out there uh, in the Silicon Valley people are working on. So how are you keeping yourself relevant? Uh, you know, also considering that you don't have like a huge design team and, you know, uh, uh, you you can go as far as uh, the technology. So how are you, you know, keeping yourself relevant, you know, because every, every day there's something new, right? So how, how do you maybe, you know, uh, carrying that load? Yeah, I would say definitely it's a struggle given that there's so much progress every day. Like every day you wake up, there's a new tool out there and they're doing something uh, slightly better. So I, I mean... Very tacky, tactically speaking, I just have this list of tools that I should keep my eyes on. And that's just constantly been growing. But now there's like 50 tools. I remember I spent like two days ago, I spent the entire day just looking at tools. I'm like, who's doing what? Who's doing what? Who's doing what? Who's doing what? And um, there were some parts where I was like, okay, this is interesting. They're doing this interestingly, but there's this component that's missing. And I feel like sometimes there's a lot of like hype cycle too when you actually try the tools and you try to do a very specific task with them, that actually helps you gauge where exactly these products are. Because you see all these like big charts where you're like, oh, all these AI companies, there's like 500 companies listed out, but only like one or two have a tool that actually works. So it, I feel like trying tools out also just like helps you see where things actually are and get like a clearer perspective on the progress. Um, other than that, like this, Things have been like opening up a lot in some of the school lately. There's more and more meetups that are happening. People are now excited to introduce themselves and like get introduced to other people. So there's just a lot more um, social appetite in the space. So I've been meeting engineers who are doing things at other startups or like founders who are doing similar things. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that everyone's open sharing their progress, which is nice. Um, like it's at least right now to me, it feels like everyone is very collaborative. Like you might see, we might see Midjourney as a competitor, but they're also really nice. Like if you talk to their team, they'll answer all your questions. They'll help you make your product better. So I wouldn't say it's competitive to the extent where people are like keeping their things just to themselves. They're, everyone's very supportive and just very collaborative. Yeah, I think that's the way of moving forward. You know, you've got to be collaborative. You have, you know, you've got to put your information out there in order to really make an impact. Uh, otherwise, because cause we all know that a lot of things which we do on a daily basis is going to become obsolete, right? So, so yeah, I mean, I, I really, it's definitely interesting that, you know, uh, how, how, I mean, uh, do, do you think that this is also a very important, you're meeting, you know, people building the same thing and what do you talk about? And, you know, I mean, you just like, do you have like one topic that you, you know, you discuss or is it like a coffee space where you, you know, just chilling? I'm just curious to know. Yeah. I mean, usually these are like more casual chats. There's no agenda, uh, but it's usually like, oh, let, let, let's meet up and, uh, 
it's often like brainstorming more like open-ended stuff. Like we are still trying to figure out, like as a company, we're still trying to figure out what is our niche. Like where can we make a difference? Where can we make a dent? But talking to people, like if I meet someone, I I try to understand um, their experience using these tools, right? Like if I'm talking to an engineer, I try to like talk to them and interview them about just their editing experience. Have they ever opened Photoshop? So I actually just like tend to become a user researcher every time I'm meeting, meeting someone. Uh, and if they have questions for me around like what's Playground doing, what's been our experience so far, I'm fairly open sharing that information too. Like I'll tell them what our learnings have been so far, uh, where we're trying to focus. Um, so these are, I would say, like mostly casual chats. Um, there are definitely bigger meetups um, where there's like 100 people. And I think recently there was like another workshop someone was doing where they were just like discussing AI stuff. So there's always some or the other event happening. Uh, I just have a slight preference for like smaller groups. So I actually get to talk to people uh, at a bigger like meetup. It's hard to uh, have a, one good conversation with any one person. It's just like kind of surface level talk to everyone. Um, but yeah, there's all formats of like meeting people, exchanging information, getting help, getting funding. Like there's just so many resources here. Like I totally feel like why Silicon Valley is like the place where so many companies get started uh, because people are just so collaborative and there's just so much social energy lately, um, which you can see in these like workshops and meetups. Yeah. And how, how does your, you know, usual day looks like at Playground? I mean, uh, again, you're going to the meetups, you are a user researcher, and I think maybe you are, uh, and someday else you're playing a different role. So how does your, you know, usual day at Playground looks like? Yeah. Um, it's a combination of all those things you mentioned. <laughs> it's uh, user research, it's like prior testing, it's also actual design work. Uh, but I'd say like in terms of like a work work, I I do try to spend a lot of time inside of Figma. Like I just try to get started with something inside of Figma because I feel like even if I don't have like a clear idea, if I just get started, if I put an art board and if I drop a frame, I feel like I start getting ideas. Like first idea will be bad, second idea will be bad, but like at the third idea would be something useful and related to something that a user told me at some point. So I do spend a lot of like time inside of Figma um, and I think the difference compared to most designers is I just do a lot of brainstorming inside of Figma as well um, so that's a big chunk of the day I'd say like 80% of the day is that 20% of the day is um, basically the, the the features that we are shipping that day itself so we've been moving pretty fast pretty much every day we're dropping a feature which sometimes breaks other things, which sometimes doesn't work as we intended. So 20% of the focus is very much on making sure that feature that we designed and shipped is working as it should be. So a lot of like testing, talking to users. We also have a Discord community, which is like always very chatty. So going through the messages there and seeing what kind of feedback is coming in, um, looking at some of the metrics. Uh, if there's features that were very optimistic or bullish on, we try to tap, track those features uh, in this um, analytics tool, tool called Mixpanel. So I'm looking at the dashboard, seeing if there was um, a prediction I made that, okay, this feature would be a hit, seeing how that actually maps to the results, right? There's always fun in uh, sort of like placing a bet on these features that you're uh, shipping. Like I'll, I'll always try to like mentally do like a math, okay, I feel like 20% of the users will find this very interesting or I don't like this would be a hit, like a lot of users would do this, and then it doesn't work that way. So you learn something there. That's it. Like twenty percent of the time is user testing, queuing, Discord support tickets, and then eighty percent of the time is really just like brainstorming design. Yeah, and and you are uh, are you still the only designer in your team, or you have like su support around you? I'm still the only designer. We are looking for one person, one more person. And uh, we've been interviewing people. Uh, we, this just like at a startup, you just, you just end up being far more selective than at a big company. At a big company, you're looking for someone, like a, a lot of profiles kind of spit for what you're looking for. At a startup, I feel like you get very selective. You're like, okay, there should also be a culture of pit. Like this person, person should also be passionate about AI tools. Like they couldn't have, um, like just 
been working in like a SaaS company for like a decade and now be like, oh, I want to do AI tools just because everyone's el- everyone else is talking about it. Like the, the motivations should align, the incentives should align. So we've been looking for a second designer. So if you have any recommendations, please pass on. Um, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, and we're also right. remote. So if uh, there is a candidate who you feel is like not based out of US, that would work as well. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people would, uh, you know, would get to get 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 such a uh, job. Uh, so, uh, I mean, mo- moving forward, you also do do. I mean, at some point, you will be, you know, ex- uh, expanding your team. You know, uh, and I mean, what what do you think are the traits, uh, you know, should be there in a designer, you know, to to work at a pace like you guys are working at. So I mean, and and how how do you think that uh, uh, you know how can you make an impact with a you know with a uh, uh, better team? Because right now, I mean, a lot of times you maybe there are not much people asking questions about design. So so do you think there's there's this gap for you since since you know you're working in isolation? I mean, when I say isolation, it's like being an only designer in the team. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I feel like so there's like within design, there's two components, right? Like one is purely just the visual, like what does the thing look like? And then there's the UX side of things that how does the user get to it? And I feel like for the latter, our team of engineers and the founder, they're all very product focused. So they like feel like if if I make a flow, which is just like super long, super complicated, or if I make assumptions about like tutorials kind of things, and I'm like, oh, the user will get here, here, here. Most people don't click on those. And I feel like my team is like really good at uh, understanding that nuance around like product flows and just the UX of things. So um, I get a lot of feedback in that respect. So I ne- I've never felt that I'm the only person who's trying to make the UX really nice and efficient. There's always feedback. There's always someone to brainstorm with. Uh, but the visual side, you are correct. Like say, how should a button look like? Should the shadow blur be 12 or like 24? Like those are the specific discussions that you can only have with a designer who's actually making things in Figma. And there's definitely like a vacuum there. Like when you're the only designer, you factor that. I, at this point, have like a few other designers uh, who I've worked with in the past. So every now and then, like if I meet them, I just like show them my designs just to like get a check of, okay, how, how do you feel about this? Like, and these are designers who I respect a lot, whose work I've seen. And I know they'll have really good feedback on my shadows and strokes and all those kind of things. Uh, but yeah, if more people join the team, I think that part of my role will become interesting. Um, there'll be more back and forth and then just be more hands in that part of the product, which will be amazing. Um, in terms of what would make good teammates, I would just say um, past experience having shipped really good products um, and having a high bar, um, someone who helps us make our product significantly better than what it is today. Um, so not just join the team and keep adding things, but actually make like a step function better product. So that's something that we always look for. And definitely someone who's okay with the speed. Like sometimes we even work on the weekends. So that's another like big part of the role that we disclose very openly. We tell that, you know, sometimes people end their day at 8 p.m. It's not always 5 p.m. ending. And sometimes like it doesn't happen all the time, but there might be some weekends where we just end up working. So that's sort of the reality of our setup at the moment. It's not going to always be like that. But um, someone who has the bandwidth to accommodate that expectation is important because we've come across candidates who are really good at design, but it's just this like extra commitment is not possible for them, which is completely fine. Uh, but that just doesn't align with our expectation at the moment. Yeah, yeah, makes sense for sure. Uh, so again, being uh, being an only designer or someone, you know, who's uh, taking the you know, bigger uh, calls in the process, uh, how do you find that balance between, you know, uh, creativity, business, and at the same time, technicality? Because, because uh, I'm sure you know, uh, uh, not not every creator would like to you know uh, put their uh, uh, feet in in in, in this pond, right? You know, I mean, uh, being a creator, it, it has always been difficult. You know, to, uh, understanding the business part of it. So, how do you maybe find that balance? Uh, you know, uh, around these spaces. 
Yeah, that's really hard. Like, to be honest, I haven't found an answer to that. Like, I have. So every every now and then, there's like every every decision that you make, or every time you make a decision to invest your energy and resources in a certain direction, you also make a decision to not invest your resources and energy in a different direction. And as a designer, I feel like I set a really high bar for what where I want the design to be, and it doesn't. Just the reality of things is that it doesn't always um, translate uh, to a level where it matches that bar, right? Like, as a creative, like I said, you always have, like, certain things you want to do a certain way. And then there's, like, a business side that comes in. There's the product side that comes in where you're like, you know what? We just have to get the user to click this button. It doesn't matter if we're aggressive. It doesn't matter if we just block the whole UI and put an arrow here because we want to teach them that they should click this button. So that's a very like in your face experience, right? Like as a designer, you'll be like, oh, like that's so distasteful. How can we add like an ad over there? Uh, but I guess like as a designer, then you also have to understand like, okay, there is certain value in that arrow, right? Uh, and then you try to understand, okay, what is the value that this arrow is bringing? And is there a way where I can make it more pleasing? Is there a way where I can still achieve that objective of the product or the business while still keeping it very aesthetic, very delightful. And it's hard. Sometimes you can, you're can you able to do it. Other times you're not. And Apple's products are like a great example where they often do it. Like Apple is like a great example for a company that is such an amazing business. And they also are able to make products that are delightful. They're not in your face. They're not forceful. They're not pushy. Um so sometimes you're able to find an answer to, okay, what should I do instead of this arrow? And other times you're like, okay, I guess we have to roll with this arrow for now, but I need to think more about it. So I'd say it's a trade-off. Um, and I think I often think of myself as like, and this is something that I've discussed very often with my founder. Um, we've had this discussion seven times and we've come to this agreement that I'm the designer. I'm always going to push for the best design. Sure, I'll try to understand your perspective as a founder as someone who's trying to run a business, but I'll still push for the best possible design. And then it's up to you, right? Like you, my role as a designer is to really raise the power of the design. Uh, and then your role as a founder is to decide whether to move forward with it or not. Um, so I think in my capacity, like I often empathize with the business decisions and I'm like, okay, you know, if I was a founder, I would be doing what you're saying. But right now, I'm a designer, so I will still push my argument. So I think that that tension is always there. And I think it's usually healthy because you're trying to just like figure out the best of both worlds. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you're doing that, you also have to, you know, keep in mind that there's some kind of, a, you know, competitive edge to your, you know, competitors. Uh, how, how do you maybe find that uh, that, that balance? You know, uh, okay, you you designed something. The next day you realize, oh, I think something similar is already out there. I mean, I'm I'm sure it it happened to you, you know, a lot. Then then I can imagine. So how do you you know keep up with with that space? So do you like do you have like a resource which constantly update you that okay this is happening, uh, you know? So yeah. I mean, which I mean related to what you are building. For example, yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of competitors. That's something that we've realized that there's going to be so many people in this space at least for the next year or two. And the truth of the matter is, it's just really hard to keep up with everyone. We just cannot keep up with every tool that's coming. There's tools that are, that are helping you make game characters. There's tools that are, that are helping you make uh, comics. So there's a new tool that comes out every single day. Um, and one thing that I do want to avoid is just like not make competitor tracking my full-time job. Like, sure, I should have some sense of the space. I should have like an understanding of who the big players are, what where the general trend is going. But I should just not be obsessed with competitors all the time. Like I'm trying to think, like, I feel like there was some founder who was talking about competitors and he was like, you know, you can pull your head just thinking about competitors all the time and just always be like, okay, we need to do this too because this competitor is doing that. We need to do this too because this competitor is doing that. And your product just ends up becoming such a hodgepodge. It's like an average of all these other products. And then it's usually just a mediocre product. And compared to that, if you just like spend your energy 
on really trying to understand what's the problem where we can actually make a difference, even if it's a direction where others are not exploring, if others are not digging. Um, I think it's worth it because then you're really trying to, you're trying to like go on a track where already there's fewer people. So you're reducing the competition, you're trying to build your intuition towards what the real problem is. And then your feature, or like that idea, that solution you come with is hopefully original. And if it works, then you have a very differentiated product. Uh, if it doesn't work, you learn something. You learn something about why everyone else is doing that other thing, or why this one thing that you were trying to do didn't work. Um, so I think that approach is a little better than always keeping track on what competitors are doing and trying to like get those features in your product. Because then as a consumer, it's again like all level playing field, right? Like if that 10 hours are doing exactly the same thing, why does the user care? They don't. Uh, sure, you felt great that, okay, now I'm caught up with my competitor because I also have this feature, but it still doesn't make for a great product or like a good business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that approach uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, uh, is, is it there for a user to, to see Playground AI? Is it like a website or like an app you have to download? Is it there? Yeah, it's a website. Uh, it's open and accessible to everyone. It's called playgroundai.com. Uh, you can go there. You'll see different categories of images and uh, we assign card images. So images that get more likes are usually on the top. Um, and um, the users can just see a different variety. Uh, and then we also have an okay-ish browser-based mobile experience because we do get a lot of traffic from mobile. Um, so it's also accessible on mobile. But the ideal experience at the moment is more desktop-focused. And how are you uh, doing the marketing? I'm just curious. I mean, are you, yeah, are you like you're reaching out to a lot of artists, designers, creatives? Yeah, it's interesting that we've actually... Fortunately, we've been lucky with our like top line numbers. Uh, we've just, we've been growing at a consistent rate ever since like last September. And the, we've never felt like we need to do explicit marketing for our tool, uh, to get more users. Uh, whatever like YouTuber is covering our tool or like recently someone made like a TikTok video in, um, South America, and we started getting a lot of like Spanish support requests. And then we were wondering, like, where are these coming from? And then one of our, like, one of my colleagues found a, a TikTok video. And apparently, that person who made the TikTok video, video is like an influencer in South America. So he covered our tool. And that's why we got so much traffic. So I'd say it's mostly just been organic. We haven't invested heavily on marketing. Um, we also realized that there's definitely a hype cycle around the AI tools. Um, and we're riding that wave because everyone's talking about AI tools. Like, you know, my dad is curious. He's like, what is, what is AI? Tell me more, right? Like, so I feel like it's at a point where it's broken into the mainstream for users as well. Like the bigger, the bigger users, like dads and grandmas, like they all have heard of AI at some point and they're curious. They all want to try things. So I feel like, Marketing for us has just been done by the hype cycle. Uh, so we're, we're not investing very actively in that. So far, we're happy with our top line numbers. Um, the biggest goal for us is very much retention. Um, so actually having a product where people come back again and again and they derive value out of it. What do you think? I, I mean, this is uh, I'm asking this out of my uh, you know curiosity. And again, you are you are meeting people who are you know creating revolutionary products like, uh, uh, you know, a DALI, for example. Uh, how do you think the, the hype's going to be in like next two, three years? I mean, do, do you think that people, it, it's going to get normalized? Because every day, it's like these days, it's like every day is like there's something new, you know, it's like every day there's something revolutionary happened. Do you think it's it's going to go like this for like, two, uh, you know, you know uh, two, three years in the future? Or do you think at some point it's going to be like, okay, it's normal now and, you know, we don't have to talk about it a lot. And, and I don't know, I, I think that's, uh, uh, I think for, for it's, it's going to be the same for the next decade. But I don't know, what do you think about that? Or maybe it's just normalized already where you are. Yeah, I, I've thought about that. And I think like, I mean, it's very cool and interesting right now because people haven't seen things like this in the past. And... Oh, what I feel, my guess is like over the next year or so, a lot of like products which aren't AI first 
the companies like Notion and Coda and companies that make presentations, even Google Docs, they leverage components of this technology to make their existing product better. And once like we start as users, once we start seeing AI assist us in all of these like different apps, which we already use, like in Gmail, there's probably a really good use, use case inside of Gmail or like an a mailing app where you can use AI to write these things for you, right? And someone's going to build that. Someone's going to build that very soon. That we like, we get used to it, will definitely become far more efficient. It will probably not be as unique or mind-blowing to us um, because we'll get used to it. Um, so that's that's my guess that uh, it's, it's a new technology. We're all excited about it, which is amazing because we've not seen anything like this before, but we'll get used to it very quickly. And your question actually reminded me of uh, uh, the previous company I used to work at. Uh, it was a self-driving car startup. And I remember the first time I took a drive in the car and it just felt very unreal uh, because there's no driver in the car. And I was like, I just can't believe it. And then I would do like more and more rides. Like every few days I would try to go on a ride because they had this like in-car tablet. So I was working on the design for some of that. And... It got normal so quickly. And I think that was my moment of realization that users get, users, not just users, like humans get um, comfortable or like normal things become mundane very quickly. Like the moment you do it like thrice, four times, five times, you're like, okay, yeah, it's not that big a deal. Um, so I feel like over time, like in a year or so, we would see AI being helpful to us and far more apps than it is today and uh, will become more efficient, will become more creative, but I don't think it would be as much of a news maker as it, it is today. Yeah, one more thing I, I've been, you know, thinking about is, uh, is you know, how these tools, because right now, you know, the, the people who are using these tools are actually professional, you know, they are, they are uh, you know, uh, even artists, you know, artists, uh, engineers, uh, and there are courses of, you know, getting prompts with tools like chat, things like that. Yes, how, how do you think that, I mean, uh, it's it's going to, th- this whole space going to affect developing countries and, you know, people uh, at, at the space where, you know, people are not that educated or, uh, you, or what do you think how, how it's going to affect, you know, developing countries and, and or do you think that it's still going to, you know, it, it's still, uh, AI still has to spend some time to make an impact out there? Yeah, I think with when you say developing countries, is there like a persona you're thinking of? Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the yeah, maybe you're so not I, that educated or you're not so professional, or I can be wrong about that because I think that a lot of people who are using the tool are professional. Uh, you know, especially when you know people who are creating images. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I feel like right now, a lot of the people who are using these tools are very tech savvy. Like they are caught up with what's happening in the space and they, they're just curious. So they're trying these tools. Uh, I think if you think about like the non-tech savvy user or the, the user who's not as proficient as at making creative images or they're not in a creative role. And I, I can use my dad as an example, right? Uh, I think what the AI tools have unlocked is just language as an interface so using a photoshop uh, and like using masking in photoshop to create like a bouquet in the background behind the head that requires a lot of skill right like you have to there's a bit of a learning curve to the tool you have to have a good computer you have to have some access to youtube so you can see tutorials there and i can never imagine my dad going through that process to create good images even though he's very much into creating Code images, although his taste is like very dated. I've seen some of the images he creates. He has like a very dated taste. But I know he has that itch in him to create something. And I feel like all humans do, right? Like we all derive joy when we create something, which is why like when we post an Instagram photo, there's such a kick because you sort of like created that, right? And AI has actually like sort of unlocked using language as an interface to do all of these tasks. And I feel like language is something that pretty much everyone, every human being picks up so early on in their life, right? Like, and now you need, they, they can use that to use all of these powerful tools. So for my dad to now make an edit inside of Playground AI to one of his images, he just has to like very quickly type what he wants changed, right? Like he doesn't have to draw an intricate mask. He doesn't have to like 
understand what shadows are. He doesn't have to understand what blur is or what Gaussian blur is to make like a perfect photo. He just has to explain what he wants to see. Um, and we all have language. So I feel like it's one of the most empowering things. It's also very equalizing, right? Like someone who's not text savvy at all can make things that are just as good as someone who's very text savvy. Um, so I, I, I feel like it'll only, it'll like, it's a trend that will rise on. It's like everyone will benefit from this. Um, the other interesting thing that I, uh, that I'm hoping for is really just more inclination towards creation and less towards consumption. Like my dad is always mentioning how people are spending hours and hours looking at TikTok videos, not doing anything else. Like they're just like sitting around in the house, spending hours. I feel like he's referring to one of my cousins, but uh, he's very bothered by the fact that people consume so much, like consume so much content. And I, I see that across demographics, right? Like even in the West, there's so much consumption. Like I, I spent so much time on YouTube. Um, but if I compare it to my creation, am I creating as much as I consume? Probably not. Um, and part of that is because these tools have a learning curve. It's not easy for everyone to create. And hopefully with these like AI tools that are super easy to use, more people start creating instead of just consuming. And I feel like just when you start creating, you're in a different mind space and it's just so much more, um, of a sustainable, I would say serotonin, uh, instead of like a dopamine hit which you get by like just consuming content so hopefully more people start creating yeah i i think it's a it's a great future for independent creators and even uh you know solo pros i i mean i'm just curious you had you had like sessions with your father about you know where you were teaching him okay how to get like the you know most out of this platform i'm just curious to go i often use him as like a user. Like I use him as like a, 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 a like lab rat, um, and I'd be like, open this website, okay? And I would give him like a random task. I'd say, okay, make an image with like an eagle for me, which has like pink feathers, and he'd try to make it. And I'll just watch him do it. I'll try to like usually ask him to like do it and like screen share, and he would do it and. I would actually be able to see all the spots in which the UX just like totally failed. Um, so yeah, he's he's like my biggest, biggest lab rat. So it's like a comfortable space for you to, you know, okay, uh, you know, you can be a little vulnerable about, you know, uh, what you've created. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, yeah this, this leads to to the last question uh, on the podcast. What's the future for for you, for, for Playground AI? I mean, where are you moving? What are you excited about? Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, our like midterm goal is to um, enable people to make, create images that they can use in their full-time jobs, right? Like not just recreational stuff, because recreational stuff is good if it's 80% there. But if you need to use something in your full-time job, it has to be 100% good. So that's our near-term goal. Uh, in the future, like I said, I'm I'm very excited about people just creating more things instead of just consuming so uh hopefully if we're able to right now we have like a large number of users and we're still growing so that number makes me really happy so the goal would be to just like keep pushing that and make the tools better so more and more people derive value out of it and i feel like someone like my dad like i mentioned already is like the hardest user to crack so if we're able to, if me, along with the Playground team, are able to make something that works for that demographic, then I think we've sort of cracked the hardest user of all. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited for people creating more instead of consuming so much. Yeah, uh, make makes so much sense, uh, Akansha, uh, and I uh, wish you all the best. And thanks again for coming on the podcast. Yeah, this was amazing. Yeah.